Oops. So remember that there's a host of, of reasons why we get together, and one of those is it says to encourage one another all the more as we get together. So it, it's just music to my ears to hear you laughing and enjoying yourself. Uh, before I, I get to the message, um, again, one of the things that we love about the fact that we have a hope. Uh, so uh, Bob McCluskey, who was an enduring part of our congregation, and about a year and a half ago, he moved back to Ontario to be with his uh, daughter, Suzanne. And uh, Bob entered into his reward uh, February 6, 2020. And so we rejoice. And uh, again, those of you who knew him, uh, that his wit was unparalleled and his poetic genius amazing. And uh, there will be a memorial service uh, this coming Saturday uh, here at 1 p.m. Uh, and uh, Suzanne and family just said, if you knew him and you'd like to come, you're welcome to do that. So we rejoice. You know what the Bible says? It says, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the home going of one of his saints. So we rejoice. Thank you, Gary. Well, this morning I want to continue our, we want to continue our series on David, the life of David. And uh, again, uh, I'm grateful for um, Danny Hunt, who is our graphics communication person. And uh, we were saying, what kind of graphic could we put up that would underscore the concept of submission and authority? And uh, we talked about it. Of course, uh, Danny being a, a dog lover, he was, uh, he was lobbying to have a picture of Hershey. No, just kidding. <laughs> Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm taking poetic license here. Uh, but we got to thinking in terms of there's probably no place that, that illustrates more the, the idea of, of submission uh, than that of the horse to the rider. And there's just something so amazing. Um, I'm not uh, uh, like a horse person at, per se, but growing up in a farm, I, I was around them. And, and when I look and I see, you know, the movies where these horses and there's just not a step between the horse and the rider. Just the subtlest pressure on the stirrup or on the hand, that horse immediately is just one with the rider. And so that's really what we want to talk about. So I want to uh, delve into this whole concept of submission and authority. Now, I have a disclaimer um, that uh, I think that what's going on in our world today, certainly we, we have to come to grips with authority, and we're going to talk about you know, what do you mean God establishes authority and all authority comes from God? I'm going to answer that. It is not in response to or knee-jerk reaction to uh, some of the things that have been going on over the last couple of weeks. But I want to let you know that this concept of submission and authority in regards to our relationship with Jesus Christ is an absolutely crucial and essential concept. And we need to understand what it means to be submitted to God. And we need, what, we need to know what it means to be submitted to godly authority. And um, I was praying about this week, and this is one of my favorite subjects. And I was thinking about it, and there's really a, a topic that cuts more deeply against the grain of our selfishness and self-centeredness and sinfulness than this one that there's something that is deeply ensconced in us because of our fallen nature that says no one is going to tell me what to do. And no one has the right to, to ask me to do anything. I'm in charge of my own life, and, and that's the way it is. And so there was a story, um, uh, and this is one of my dad's stories, um, and some of you have heard it, but there was this little boy that was, was, um, was, was uh, standing up in the classroom. And the teacher said, little Johnny, please be seated. And he continued to stand rigid. And uh, finally, after being shamed and, and uh, cajoled by the teacher, he sat down and then he raised his hand and she says, yes, Johnny. He says, I just want you to know, I may be sitting down, but I'm standing up on the inside. So this whole idea of, of submission and authority, it touches so many areas of our life. Uh, those of you who work for someone, there is a dimension there is you're not going to stay employed if you are not willing to submit to the direction of your company or your boss. And you might say, well, but he or she is not worthy of my submission. And I'm not going to do it. 
And so we want to talk about that. And David provides a tremendous picture of how do you and I, as followers of Jesus, how do we submit to external authority? And what do we do when the authority to which we are asked to submit is not acting in integrity? So I want you to turn with me to your Bibles to to 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. So I want to put this into context for you. And and what I did over this last week, I was rereading the story of David. And, uh, you know, we know about David and Goliath, and we know about, you know, him being a shepherd and whatever. But but David, oh, excuse me, and we also know about the fact that he became king, and he was a a very wise king, and, and God used him amazingly. But what we don't, often comment on or we don't often bring to the fore is the valley between his anointing to be king and when he became king. But there was a season of time where God was working on David to teach him the importance of being submitted and to be under authority. And again, uh, you can say, well, that's easy. You know, there's some people that are just easy to submit to, right? They're just, they just is. Like, they're just, you know, you know that they have your back and they know that they, that they love you and whatever. But the reality is my experience is that in dealing with human authority, more often than not, that it's very difficult because there's this internal dialogue, again, that, that raises this ugly head and says, nobody's going to tell me what to do. And I am the master of my own fate. So uh, here's what happened. So following David's triumph over Goliath by faith and by obedience, that Saul looked at him and said, hey, I want that guy serving on my team. And so again, as you read through this, it was interesting that Saul is a very complicated individual, and that's not our topic for today. But, but, but even in the midst of what became madness, that Saul had this soft heart. And so what happened was, is that on more than one occasion, even in the midst of him chasing David down like, like a rat, that, that Saul would say, oh, is that you, my son, David? That there's this conflict that going on in between. So basically, everything was wonderful uh, with David serving Saul when Saul was troubled by, by a tormenting spirit that David became a harpist and he would play. And as he played, that there was this presence of God that would come and would help calm him down. But then what happened was, is that something began to, very insipid, began to creep into Saul's life and it was jealousy. And so one day, as David was out and he became kind of uh, Saul's go-to guy, if there was a problem, he would send David and David would come back and triumph. And then in the streets, what happened was, here was the song that the women and the people were saying, Saul has slain his thousands. And that was pretty good. Like, yeah, why didn't it? But then the next line of the, 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 the refrain was, and David has slain his ten thousands. And jealousy gripped his heart. Instead of seeing David as a blessing, he saw him as a threat. And so in the midst of all of this, there's something here about mutual submission. What happens is we need to be aware of the fact that as God raises up people in our fellowship that have gifts from him for the furthering of his kingdom and this church, instead of seeing them as threats, well, who do they think they are, blah, 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 or you know, whatever, we need to be people who understand that as people are submitting themselves to God and as they are beginning to be established in places of, of serving here, that we need to be people who are saying they are a blessing. Did you just follow what I said? Yes. Now, as we work our way through this, there's this issue here where, so basically, so David, one day he's playing in his harp and uh, Saul was so ticked off with him, and Saul had a javelin. And so what happened was, is that just out of the blue, that Saul threw a javelin, and, his, and the Bible's really clear. It says he wanted to pin him to the wall. <laughs> you know, and uh, David was quick, and he ducked. And the good thing is, is that he didn't pick up the spear and throw it back. 
And we're going to see that throughout this story, David would say, I am not going to touch the Lord's anointed. I will not take matters into my own hand. I am going to be a person who is going to be submitted to authority over me as long as it's not illegal, unsafe, or immoral. So that's a check here. And I'm giving you, if you're looking for stuff to kind of help you kind of negotiate this whole thing, is we're going to see this later in the sermon, but this is my little trailer, that the reality is, is that there are places when, when human authority asks you to do something, and then there's a point where you must obey God rather than men. So, But the question is, and I told this to my kids, I said, look, I'm dad, and I know more than you because I've lived longer, and I have your back, and as long as I'm not asking you to do something that's unsafe, immoral, or illegal, I expect for you to be willing to do what I'm asking you to do. And one day you will thank me. So David then, he, he tries to do all of the right things. And then Sam, uh, uh, David had a, his best friend, uh, Jonathan, whom we'll talk about later in this series. And, and Jonathan would go to bat and says, Dad, just calm down. You know, talk him off the ledge. And David, look at what David's done for you. And so Saul would repent and says, bring him back. And he'd sit at the table until his jealousy would rise up. And finally, it got so bad that David had to run for his life to the desert. Now, in running to the desert, coming back to the wonderful um, worship set that, that Leanne got received from the Lord, that what happened was is that David had to trust that God knew what he was doing and so he said, but I thought I was called to be the king. I thought I was anointed. And here I am running like a rat from a guard dog. But in the midst of that, he would continue to say, even though I do not understand God, I will trust your plan. Now, let me just let you know something. When you decide to follow Jesus... It isn't all like this way and up to the right. Wouldn't that be nice? But there are these times, and what happens, I have found that it is in the valleys that often God does his best work, and I am, am changed and forever uh, understanding of the fact that God is moving me from here to there. Now, here's something I learned about valleys. A valley is the most gradual and direct way to get from one elevation to the other. Here's the mountains, here's the valley. And so I, I liked reading about, you know, um, history and when they were opening up um, the, the, the um, continental uh, North America to Canada and the United States, that what would happen was the Courier de Bois, the, 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 the frontiersmen, what they would do, they were always looking for a pass, and a pass is a valley. So instead of fighting against what God's doing in the valley, say, Lord, what are you wanting to do in and through me? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff comfort me. Now, again, the rod isn't there to thump on the sheep. The rod is there to gently guide and to gently prod. And says, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way. And I was reading about this in, in one of the books I, I read. It's called A Shepherd Look at Psalm 23. And Philip Keller, who I, I really enjoy, he said that in reality, that the rod and the staff, that it was a point of comfort that what happened is that the shepherd would just lay the rod on the back of the sheep and say, I'm here. I'm here. Instead of getting thumped, it was a point of comfort. Well, anyways, what this brings us now to Psalm, uh, to 1 Samuel 24. So David is running from Saul, and Saul is coming after him. And, and David had this group of mighty men, which we're also going to talk about. There were 600 men that everybody had given up on. And uh, in, in, the, in the Hebrew, it's really interesting. They're called, and, and in the King James, they're called sons of Belial. And the word Belial is, it means worthless, hopeless. And that's a whole other sermon. But what happens is, is that Satan sees you and I as people of Belial that were worthless. And God takes us and says, yeah, but you don't see what I see. And so this group of men, I guess it was 400, not 600, forgive me. 
400 men, these guys who everybody else had given up on, they became one of the most amazing fighting forces. And they were called David's mighty men because they recognized the fact that as they submitted to this man who had their backs and as he was submitted to God, that there was amazing things that God would do. So I'm going to just say it bluntly, is that unsubmitted people are dangerous. I'm going to say that again. Unsubmitted people are dangerous. They are dangerous to others, but most of all, they are dangerous to themselves. Because unsubmitted people are given to their own stuff. They're not team players. And again, when you don't learn how to be submitted to authority, then you will struggle with submitting to God. Now, I want you to hang with me. I know this is a little bit tough, but hang with me. I want to run this together. So basically what happens is David's running. Saul's after him. In one place, it was 3,000 men. And, and so basically, now this is where it's a little earthy. So David and his, his mighty men, they were... They were hiding out in this cave. And Saul, King Saul, the army's on the outside. There's only one way in, one way out. Saul goes into the cave to relieve himself. In other words, he went to the restroom. Now, he was in a very well, vulnerable place, as you can imagine. And so David and his mighty men, they are in the back of this cave. And, and basically, people are saying, hey, this is your chance. Strike him down. And he went and he cut off a little bit of Saul's garment. And then when Saul left, and, and they're outside, and here comes David. And I have a picture of one of my Bible story books. And here's David, and he's holding up the piece of the robe. And he's saying, look, is this yours? And basically he's saying, look, I want to prove to you that I'm not out to get you. And he kept saying, I will not take things into my own hands. I will trust that God is my defender. Because one of the things I've observed about revenge is, is it's, you never balance the scale. Right? I hit you, you hit me back harder. I hit you back harder. You hit me back harder. And it's a conscious, vicious thing. And there's something here about submitting to God and saying God is faithful. He is just. He is righteous. He is more righteous and more just than we can possibly understand. And at the end of the day, even though it may be a long day, God balances the scales. But when we start to take stuff in our own hands and try to exact our own vengeance, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Only God is holy and righteous enough to exact justice. So then, basically, Saul says, oh, I'm so sorry, and whatever. And things look pretty good, but then, basically, what happens is in, in Samuel 26, similar situation. David's running from Saul. And they, they're up in one place and they're, Saul and the mighty, and his guys are all camped there and his second in command, Abner, a great mighty warrior. And what happens is David and a few of his guys, they go in and he says, well, some of you come with me. Now I was looking at this passage of scripture and I can't prove this, but he says, I'm going down there. Will somebody come with me? And they're asleep. I wondered if he was toying with the idea of ending Saul. I don't know. It's, but why, why did he say, come with me? So they get down there and it says a deep sleep had fallen by the, and so they're all camped around in, in chapter 26 and they're all camped around. And what's happening is, is that there, so here's Saul, he's sleeping, his javelin, his spears there, and there's a water bottle. And they, and one of the guys next to him says in chapter 26, he says, let me strike him and I will not strike him twice. And David looks out up, up to, up to him and he says this. He says, I will not touch the Lord's anointing. And it's in verse 9 of chapter 26. He says, but David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that is near his head and let's go. Now, as you read through here, we see here that 
again, so it's basically, it's interesting here that, again, David, and I have this picture from a, from a storybook, and so here's David, and he's up there, and he, he, he says, here I am. Like, you know, he put himself at risk. He says, hey, do you recognize this? And he chides Abner, the big guy. He says, where were you? You were not paying attention. You deserve to die. You were not taking care of the person that you were supposed to be doing. But he says, all right, but then this is interesting. I love this. In um, uh, verse 21 of chapter 26, it says, Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son. Because you considered my life precious today, I will not try to harm you again. Lie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Surely I have acted like a fool and have erred greatly. Here is the king's spirit, David answered. Let one of your young men come and get it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. I'm not trying to be melodramatic here, but I am saying that this story, these stories are the way to living a life that God can bless. And instead of complaining and instead of saying, well, he doesn't deserve or she doesn't deserve, look for ways to serve and be Jesus in the midst of difficult circumstances. Vengeance is mine. And, and he said, I won't touch the Lord's anointed. So now, as we go through here, the moral of the story is that God is our defender. Now, the next thing is, turn with me to Romans chapter 13. Now you say, well, why would God choose somebody who, like Saul to be the, the king? And so here's my take on this. this. is a longer story than I have time for. But I love the fact that God sees people's potential and he has a plan for their life. But because he loves, he releases people knowing full well that they will fail. But the failure is not on his unwillingness to give them a shot. It is in their disobedience, and they're fumbling the ball. Now, I don't know if you understand it, but that is just mind-boggling that God would give people authority and give them an opportunity knowing full well that they can abuse it, and yet he's not up there saying, well, I'm going to make the decision, and I'm going to make the decision for them. Now, you may have to unpack that a bit, but are you following me? Now, what about Adolf Hitler? That's the famous one. And so turn with me. Here's Romans chapter 13. And this should be marked in your Bible, electronic or otherwise. And first one, it says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. So I want to look at this. It's interesting. In, in, in the King James and in the Greek, it says, you submit yourself to the higher authority, the highest authorities. So I want to paint you a picture. All authority is, 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 is uh, ordained, it says, or is established by God. So here's what this passage of scripture means. You must always obey the highest authority. And the ultimate high authority is God. Human authority, if you track this down philosophically, that the police have authority because they have been entrusted with that by the mayor and the council. And the mayor has authority because they've been elected by the people. And, and then there's all of this. And ultimately, there's the whole divine right of kings to rule or queens to rule. But ultimately, the king or queen has authority only when they are themselves, uh, they are submitted to the highest authority. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? All authority is established by God. It's not saying despots and people like Adolf Hitler and Pol Pot, or you can take a host of people from history that were just horrible people. But we're saying the concept of authority, authority is established by God. And when human authority is under godly authority, regardless of whether they are Christian or not, if they are not asking you to do something immoral, illegal, or unsafe, there is a point where you say, if, if he likes the coffee at your boss and you make coffee and he likes it strong, you make it strong. I'm not being silly here. Are you following what I'm trying to say? All authority. But here's the, the caveat. 
implied in this is we are called to we are called to be submitted to the highest authority when human authority regardless of the consequences steps out and is no longer under godly authority we have the responsibility to obey god rather than men are you following what I'm trying to say? It has nothing to do with whether the, the, the leader is righteous or a Christian or whatever. But, but again, if that's a preference, there's something really good about saying it's not what I would do, but it's not immoral, illegal, or unsafe. If that's what the boss wants me to do, then I'm going to do that again as long as it's not immoral, illegal, or unsafe. Did you hear me? Now, the true test of submission isn't when you agree. The true test of submission is when you don't agree and you do it because you've been asked to do it. So, I give you two examples. The midwives in Exodus 1.17. Pharaoh, person in authority. He's threatened by the Israelites. And so he takes a horrible, horrible position and he says, I want you to kill all the male children. And they didn't just say yes or no, sir, three bags full, sir. But the, it says that the midwives, they feared God and they, they refused to kill the, the male children. Now, guess what? They put their lives at risk because they had to be in, under the the highest authority. Are you following me? I want to make sure you're, see, and here's what happens is in the, 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 the disciples in Acts 5, 29. So they're preaching about Jesus and they're going about healing and whatever. And the Sanhedrin, some of them, the ones that were the loudest, they were saying, you know, we forbid you to do this. Now they were in authority, but, but the apostles, they said, look, we cannot help but be obedient to God. We must obey God rather than men. Now here's a, another thing that's very important in this. When you take a stand for righteousness, it doesn't guarantee that you will not feel the backlash of that. So you can say, yeah, but I did all the right things and I was submitted and blah, 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 blah. And I lost my job. Well, we just saw that played out in the United States, didn't we? Where it says we must tell the truth. We must follow our conscience. I'm not saying good, bad, right, or wrong. I don't want to politicize this. I want to keep church and state and politics all separate. But we had some examples of people who chose to do what they felt was the right thing, regardless of the consequences. And I want to say to you that as we become a part of a society that is increasingly immoral and amoral, that there are going to be times where it has been very easy for us to be Christian in this society. And I can only see as we move forward into the future that there could be a time when people who do the right thing could end up ending up in jail here in North America. So that's fear-mongering, but are we going to say we must obey God rather than men? So here's the deal. God is the source of all authority, and he is the one who validates authority. Let me tell you, as a, as a father, and you know, you know, Alicia's here with me, and you, I don't know if we ever had this conversation, but I would like to tell you that I always did everything right as a dad. I didn't. I would like to tell you that I always corrected my children in a godly way. I did it. I did my best. But what I observed is when I corrected our kids and I was standing in that godly authority where my heart was pure, I wasn't just frustrated with them because they were kids or what they did or whatever. But when I was under that godly authority, when I would correct them, that there was just the, this power that went behind it. And what I observed is, is that they more often than not, to use my father's word, stayed corrected. Did you follow what I just said? See, when we get in line with this godly authority, that wonderful things happen because God establishes that authority. 
And then I leave you with this, and, and uh, would somebody come to just put, have a little music here? I was going through all of this, and then I was, as I was praying, putting the finishing touches on this, and then the Lord said, but Tom, you forgot the most important thing, is that ultimately it's not about submission to, to human authority or parents or pastors or whatever, but ultimately it has to do with being submitted to God. You want to show that next slide. James 4, 7 says, submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee. This is the the nugget here, folks. So let's say you disagree with what I've said. I release you to sort this out. I would ask you to think about it, pray about it. But if you disagree with everything else that I've said, I want you to to zero in on James 4, 7 because if you submit to God everything else that I said will automatically fall into place are you still with me submit to God that means that I'm not doing what's easy that means that I am not being motivated by selfishness or rebellion but it means that I am allowing God to do what he wants to do. And when we really get that when we submit to God that we and we say no to ourselves, that's when God can really use us. So I want you to close your eyes if you would. And again, if you're new to, with us this morning, we do this every week, but maybe you're here this morning and you, 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 you believe there's a God, but you don't have a personal relationship with God. And just right where you are, you can raise your hand. And I just like, love a chance to pray with you. You're saying, I'm, I'm tired of doing things in my own strength and my own abilities. And I, I'm going to let Jesus be my Savior. And I'm going to work toward allowing him to be Lord. Is there anybody like that raising your hand? I'd love a chance to pray with you. Anybody? Okay. So the next thing is this. I would like to tell you that I have arrived on this one. I've made progress, but there are lots of times where my selfishness, self-centeredness, arrogance, pride rises up and says, I'm going to do what I want. And it's not very often that it's a verbal thing, but it's it's something that just is there before I even know, and it informs my behavior. Are you a Saul or are you a David? Are you going to submit to God? Are you going to let God work in the midst of difficult circumstances? If he leads you to the desert to work some things out, are you willing to say, okay, God, you're God and I'm not? Now, here's the deal. If we're all honest with ourselves, I think every one of us could raise our hands to this. So I'm just going to pray. But I want to just say we, we, we've, we're introducing something new to our culture that when, I, when we, we're going to have you stand and if God has said something to you today, either in the first part of we were dealing with fear or in this next part where we're dealing with submission, there are people that are going to be here at the front. And when you go forward, it's not like you got this big trouble or big problem, but sometimes it's just as Peter said a couple weeks ago that sometimes you just need to just say, hey, God spoke to me and I just want you to just Stand with me on that. But I want to just pray for all of us. Lord Jesus, I ask for truth. Lord, you said that you, using the old King James, it says that you search for truth in our innermost parts, within our innermost beings. And Lord, I I have quoted often Jeremiah 17, 9, that says, the heart is despitefully wicked, who can know it? Lord, I've said countless times from this stage that if we could help ourselves, we would, but we can't, we need you. But Lord, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the reverence of God and saying, you're God and we're not. Father, I pray for every single one of us here. Lord, we're all in a different space in this. We're all in a different place of this journey. But Lord, my experience tells me and my spirit tells me and your word tells me that that this thing about, about submitting to you is, is something that is constant and continuous. Lord, I pray, God, that you would embolden us, Lord God, to be truthful and honest. It's easy for us to, to ridicule and rail against people who aren't truthful. But Lord, 
the greatest person that I deceive isn't others, it's myself. And I pray that, Lord, that in for every single one of us, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to be truthful in our innermost being, that we would recognize the fact that we need you. Lord, I pray, God, that if there was something I said that was offensive, that was of me, just blow it away. But Lord, if there was things that I communicated that have hit at a deep spot, Lord, I would pray that people would not reject the message, but that this would be something that will change us as we walk towards you. Lord, I pray, God, that you would help us to follow you with all that we have. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Just want to pause again here. Maybe there's a word of affirmation or confirmation. I just want to make sure that I don't miss something that God wants to do. Okay, Lord, I just feel that I need to just pray for strength for people. Lord, that I read this in my personal devotions not long ago where Paul writes, he says, in my in my spirit, I say yes, but in my flesh, I see a different thing at work. Oh, wretched man that I am, who can help me? I pray, God, that you would help us. It's not a human endeavor in Jesus' name. Would you just stand with me? And before I dismiss, we're going to do this again. Um, we have people who are here, and if you like to pray with people, it's not just, just only a, a chosen few, but if you like to pray with people and you want to just come and just pray. But if you, right where you are, before we dismiss, if you want just somebody to pray with you and those that are have agreed to pray, would you just come forward and just, they're going to just stand here. Please don't miss out. And I think there's some others of you that like, you know, that would just love to pray with people. But just, would you just move now? I just, I really don't, please don't miss. There's a few of you who just need to come. And would you just, just again, would you just say, I need prayer. Please do that. Don't miss. Don't miss the opportunity. Please don't miss this. There's, there's some more of you. Please don't miss an opportunity. I'm going to only ask you this once. Or maybe you're saying, oh, this is just too, too many people look at me, but come to the end. Okay, Lord, we're going to just trust you that you're going to just do what you need to do, Lord. And I pray that, that maybe people are saying, well, I just don't want to be a spectacle. Well, that's not the way we work here. Jesus, just work what you want to do. We ask us, we pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.